These boots have doubled in price since I have bought them. So, the question has to be asked, three years later, are the Creosote nail shanks still worth it? Hello, I'm Carl Marowski, and this is the channel that helps you own less and own better. I can't believe it's been three years since I've reviewed these boots. Even among stiff competition from Whites, Wesco, NYX, John Lofgren, etc., these continue to be my favorite boots. And I was even lucky enough to collaborate with Gabard from Creosote on a pair of special boots that we did last year. If you got in on that, congratulations, because we only made seven pairs of them, and uh, so that was pretty cool. But these here, why in the world would they continue to be my favorite boots? I think that's the thing that a lot of people ask because I get more questions about these than any other pair of boots that I own. So when I got these, uh, the company was called MYG Handmade and they were $900. At that point, these were the most expensive boots that I had ever bought. Second place was the White's Bounty Hunters, but these right here at 900 bucks, I couldn't believe I was spending that much money. But I think that speaks to just why I got them, you know? It, I had never seen a boot like this, and that's actually something that happens quite a bit. I get this visceral reaction from people when I use these in the thumbnail, which I think they appear in a couple of different videos as the thumbnail. People are always asking, what are those boots? There's really nothing else out there that looks quite like them. I had that feeling too, so I was like, I have to have these, I don't care what the wait period is, uh, you know, the price, uh, let's just deal with that as is, but man, these are, these are gorgeous. I had to get them and, uh, and I did, but now that they're 1850, you know, you have to really look at exactly what you're getting. So that's what we're going to do. So one of the most rewarding things about doing these videos is the fact that I get to find these smaller makers like Creosote, like Field Leathers, and I get to bring them to you and you get a smoke and deal because they're still a small shop and they haven't had to increase their prices to accommodate scale. So the bigger a brand gets, the more people they hire, the more overhead they have, the, the higher their prices have to be. So if you watch these channel, uh, my channel and you watch these videos, hopefully you are getting in on the ground floor of some really great brands. And that's what MYG was. And that's why, you know, when I bought these at 900 bucks, that's what they were. And the point of this whole channel is to help you buy products that you will have for a long time. That you So you end up spending more on better but in the end, you actually end up spending less because you have those items for a much longer time. At least that's the intention here. So when it comes to boots, $100 boots are usually pretty shoddy. You're gonna find mostly cemented construction. You're gonna find, you know, subpar leathers. If it even is leather, you'll find a lot of genuine leather. Uh, you know, for the most part, they might last for a little while. Ine inevitably though, they're probably gonna fall apart pretty quickly. Now, $200 boots, sometimes you could find things like stitch down construction, like with Jim Green. Sometimes you could find some decent Goodyear welting, some okay leather. But for the most part, what you're going to find is there's a lot of synthetic materials in there to make up for the price. So a good example is Thursday boots. Not bad. A lot of times people see them as almost like the entry level, the gateway drug to higher end boots because they are using a lot of synthetic stuff. So a pour on insole, um, you know, your heel stiffener, your toe, um, your structured toe, is that leather or is that a uh, uh, synthetic material? Those synthetic materials, if it's uncomfortable to begin with, it just won't get any more comfortable. Leather on the other hand will conform, it'll mold, and that's what, not mold, but it'll mold to your foot. And that's why good boots tend to get better with age. The step up to a $300 boot is usually one worth making because here you're gonna find leather from tanneries that you may have actually heard of, like Horween. You're also going to find things like possibly a leather midsole. You're gonna find a lot more uh, higher end materials inside of your boot and they'll typically last you for 10 years or more if you take care of them and especially if you resole them. I used to work with a guy, Pat, he resold his Red Wings twice. Uh, before he just bought a new pair because they were just pretty much shot. The uppers were pretty pretty tired. But usually $300 that around that point is where things start to get kind of interesting. Past that are the $500 boots or so. We're talking about Knicks, Whites, Westco, Franks, uh, Viberg, you know, that kind of stuff. And typically here, now Viberg might be a little bit more closer to $700. Typically here, this is where you're going to start finding things like much thicker materials. A lot of times these products are really built, especially with the brands that I mentioned, what I'm more uh, familiar with, are built with durability in mind as priority number one. 
they are work boots after all, even though some of them have, you know, sort of a, a, a casual lifestyle line. This is where I think your, your money goes the furthest, because if you buy a pair of boots from that tier in the, around the $500 mark, you're gonna get a lot of great materials, very minimal, generally speaking, synthetic materials inside where you don't see them. And these are boots which could last you for the rest of your life if you take care of them, depending on how much you beat them. I am speaking in broad generalities here just to make things brief. So usually that tier is where I recommend buying from. Now beyond this $700, let's say, you know, five to $700 price tag, what are you paying for that you're getting with boots like this? Like I said, purchase this, 900 bucks. Well, if you pay attention, what you'll see is that the higher the tiers go, the more handwork is involved. So factory made boots are literally made on assembly lines, passed down just to produce as many as they possibly can. $300 boots, maybe a little less so, maybe just higher material, higher quality materials still produced with that factory assembly line type of thing. Boots that are made by Whites, Knicks, Wesco, that kind of thing are still made with an assembly line type of structure, but oftentimes much more handwork in there, less robots. People are actually making your boots, okay? So past that tier, what you're gonna be getting is extremely high quality materials, which usually just don't have any upper limit. So you'll be getting things from Shinky Tannery, a Battle Assey, uh, Horween. There's a lot of different tanneries out there. These are kind of the rock star tanneries that, that are available, so the upper, and all of the components should be of very, very high quality, the highest quality materials, depending on what they're trying to achieve with that particular boot. But the bigger component is the labor component. How much labor is going into each one? And if, you know, I'm in construction, the material cost for a building for almost any kind of infrastructure is a small percentage compared to the labor component of any job. What you're paying for is the labor to put these things together. So one man or two people in a workshop, they are spending a long time taking your measurements, putting these things together, finishing them, doing everything that they do that makes their brand what it is. And on top of that, they had to create the design to begin with. This is a, a unique design, right? They, they actually had to make this thing, pattern it out. Um, there's a, a a term for what basically is when you scale a boot up or scale it down so it doesn't look out of proportion. These are all things that they have to do. Pay for a run of lasts from, you know, a smaller size seven to a size 11 or whatever they get. These are all things that are sort of lumped into the price of that boot. So what we're really looking at is high quality materials, artistic design and hand work. Those are three components which really do add up to a very high price tag. Now I felt that all of that going down that rabbit trail was necessary in order to understand where I stand with the creosote nail shanks. If you're looking for a boot that will just give you the biggest bang for your buck, again, shop in that five to $700 price point, you will get a boot that will last you a long time that is very decently finished and most likely the last boot that you'll ever want or need. That's where your money is gonna go the furthest. After that, honest to God, Buying a boot like this, or one from Roll Club, or White Cloud, or Clinch, any of these, these, these higher-end brands, is frankly a waste of your money. Because what you're looking for, if you were asking that question and thinking that spending this kind of money is stupid, what you're looking for is probably durability that looks pretty good, which I think a lot of people are. So don't waste your money on stuff like this. There's no point. You will not get extreme durability beyond what, you know, a, a Viberg or a NYX is putting out. You just won't get it. Past that, what you're paying for is the artistic component. Now, there were two things that really made me want to buy the nail shank. The first, like I mentioned, is the design. The design is, is so cool, so unique, I just had to have it. The second component is hand welting. Hand welting is, I'm gonna really give you simple terms here because I've never done it myself, but I have seen it done a, a number of times, more or less where a, a, a boot maker will carve in a hold fast channel along the bottom of your boot and then using oftentimes custom made needles out of piano wire, guitar string, they will hand stitch the upper um, to, the, to the lower. And, and it's, I mean, it, it's pretty amazing stuff. There is no machine that can replicate this process. The closest that I've ever seen is Viberg's uh, channel 
uh, Goodyear welted construction. I think what that's trying to do is emulate the same type of thing. However, it, it isn't the same thing. I mean, it's the difference between anything that's handmade, and anything that's machine made. So that's probably the closest you can get. These were handmade, uh, hand welted, and, and that was the kind of thing that I, I really prized. I wanted a pair of those in my collection. Now, since hand welting takes hours, if not days, instead of a few minutes, as on like a Goodyear welting machine, especially with a canvas rib, you may be asking yourself, okay, what's the benefit? My shoes now, the sole doesn't just fall off when I'm walking around. And that's the problem. To describe the difference between the two is something that you really have to feel. Number one, you have to have an appreciation for an old world quality. These people who are making these, these type of boots can, can really make sure that every stitch is absolutely perfect, perfectly spaced, perfect amount of tension, all that stuff. But there's also a sense of tightness, if I could be so, you know, bold saying that not that the boot is tight but there's a tighter feel overall the chassis of the boot is is of higher quality of a more sound foundation that's basically what it is now the design that is inevitably what draws most people to this boot it's certainly what drew me to it this has a certain presence about it when you look at these, they don't look like anything else that I've quite seen. I think that the closest I've ever seen to this style might be the 310 last from Viberg, but it's still, I mean, it, I'm talking close as in like, you know, it's within you know, spitting distance, but it's not the same thing. Just the fact of, of the way that they're made, the, the squared off toe box, I mean, they just look like a back alley bruiser mixed with a gentleman's boot, especially with that that nicely carved in waist there. These are made to your foot measurements, so there's really not a stock size. You don't buy like a nine and a half. Um, you send in your measurements and they are custom made to your feet. So you, you get these things and they are already kind of pre-broken in. It's, it's, it's quite amazing. And that's what it should be with most products that are made to your foot. The breaking in should really be uh, the softening of the leather where it needs to fold, you know, so along the backside here where there's the, you know, your your heel, your ankle will be, and along the inside of the toe, right behind your toes, right, where it flexes. Those are the only spots that should really need any kind of break in. Besides that, I was able to put these on and walk around all day. But it was that intangible vibe of a sort of macabre, um, in your face, unapologetic, kind of hot rod attitude that drew me to these boots and was why I, I clicked the buy it now button to begin with. I, I may be over romanticizing these things and that's okay. I, I really am a geek about this stuff. I absolutely love it and I'm not ashamed to admit that. Now, actually wearing these boots is a bit of a trip. They're the weirdest combination of stiff and flexible that I've ever felt. The actual leather itself isn't overly thick. Gabard, you know, it's doubled up in places and he kind of says that it doesn't need to be overly thick. We're, I mean, I forgot what the actual weight of it is. I think it's closer to five ounces, uh, even thinner in some places where it has to be layered and layered and layered, but it's pretty floppy and right out of the box, it was like this. So the upper part here, um, you know, is, is quite flexible, but when it comes to the heel counter, he puts in these layers of, you can see, I can't even compress that with my finger. Um, these layers of leather, which create that that heel cup, right? It really just, you, you kind of like put your foot in there and then it just sinks into place. It's pretty amazing. Same thing can be said for the, the toe stiffener here. You know, this is not a celastic toe or any kind of synthetic materials. It's what we're talking about here is just layers and layers of leather, which create that structure. So it's stiff in the toe, stiff in the heel, but pretty loose everywhere else. So you feel pretty locked in. It's, it's, it's an interesting feeling, which I really haven't felt with any other boot before. And this might sound like BS, but I swear to God, I walk faster in these. I don't know if that's all in my head, definitely could be. But often when I'm walking, I feel that my, my heel lifts up quicker or something. Probably because it's so cupped by that, uh, by that, that heel counter there. They call that the triple X back curve which is just layer upon layer, and uh, it's pretty it's pretty stiff, pretty cool. Almost gives it a spine look in the way, which is uh, pretty cool, pretty cool looking too. Now, the one thing I've noticed, and if I had to give a con to these, it would be that these are the loudest boots that I own. When I walk, you can definitely hear it. And I mean, they do have a rubber pad on the back. There's really not much of one there, but when I walk, 
step on the floor, especially a hard, you know, like a, a tile floor or a wood floor, you can hear it. You can definitely hear it. And this is probably something that I will actually have changed when I inevitably resole them or send them back for kind of a refreshing. They're starting to get there now. I think that I would go with a, a softer heel pad because this thing really, it lets you know, you know, so it's not a first. And I think if you've ever wore leather sold shoes, it's not something you would be unused to. And it's not like you sound like a horse coming through, but you know, you got a solid leather heel there and not much of a, of a rubber heel pad. So they are quite loud. I'd say that's maybe the one thing that I, I, I'd say is a con about this particular model. Now, the rough out leather was actually treated with a walnut oil and I think vitamin E uh, treatment. Now, this is actually kind of something that Gabar does quite a bit. He will get leather, which is a natural color, and then typically dye it himself. What that does is gives him control over the way that they're made, but it also makes them all unique so he could do what he likes. And this has sort of resulted in an almost waxy, like, like a waxed flesh look. So what you get over time is the fuzziness of the the actual rough out leather starting to come through and it, it gives it a really cool look over time you could definitely see where it started to break in so a little bit of patina the underside of this leather you can see here it's almost kind of an orangey color like you can see beneath the toe here and that dark almost black uh dark brown which is dyed over the top of that will eventually come off and these things just look cooler and cooler with time so overall the nail shanks they wear like no other boots that i have they look like no other boots that I have. And in a lot of ways, they remind me of the first time I, ro I rode a uh, rigid framed motorcycle. Definitely not for the faint of heart, certainly not for the novice. Then again, I'm pretty sure that no novice would go ahead and buy a pair of nail shanks as their first boot. Now let's talk about the barrier to entry because I think that that's one of the things people are always struggling with. You wait 36 months now for these. When I ordered them, it was, I think, six months. Uh, 36 months, he's become more popular and the price is 1850. Now there's the nail shank 2.0, which actually has a few differences from this one right here. I believe it's a different leather. He's just refined the pattern over the last three years. It's just a little bit different. You've got to be sure that you want these. I mean, I know that they look awesome and, and all that, but you know, you've got to be sure. These are certainly not what I would recommend for anybody who is just getting into boots. Um, you've got to kind of know what you like now, when Gabbard, he likes to say that he doesn't have customers, he has clients. He likes to talk to you. He will figure out what it is that you like, where your problem areas are, and help you address those. So I think that you'll even, you would even get about as far as the phone conversation with Gabbard before you realized these aren't for me, or they are for me, and let's go ahead. So there's something that requires a lot of thought, probably some saving to even get to the point of where you're going to buy them. But once you do get to that that spot, you'll have a section. You'll have a kind of a point to turn back, is what I'm saying. Because you got to be sure. You got to be sure. It's like buying a eighty thousand dollar hot rod. You've got to be sure. And so Gabard only produces about thirty five pairs of boots a year, and with seventy to ninety hours worth of work going into each pair, it's easy to see why. So waiting thirty six months is because that's the way it is. There is a demand for them. So. Even if you objected to the price of these or whatever, it's not like he's sitting there going, oh darn, I needed a new order. No, I think if anything, he's probably turning people away now. And that's another cool thing. The exclusivity of these. You know, you speak to Gabbard, you talk to him and, and decide whether if these, these are for you or not. But in a way, I think that what he's doing too is making sure that you are the type of person who his work will be in good hands with. Uh, I don't have any real reason to say that other than I think that he he is able to be picky enough that he can choose who he wants to work with or not. And if you're not his ideal customer, um, or you're just somebody who's doing things for like Instagram, I don't know. What, I don't really know, uh, but I think that he has a chance to sort of say, you know what, maybe these aren't for you, and then maybe recommend you to somebody else. So I'll finish up with this final point. What these represent to me is one of the last American-made bootmakers. Brian the bootmaker from Roll Club is doing things in a similar fashion with his boots, but what Gabbard and Creosote are doing is kind of the way things used to be done and are very rare now, it seems. Now, that does seem to be getting a little bit better. There are bootmakers in Japan, in China, Indonesia, and in uh, um, Europe who are, who are making things the old-fashioned way, but 
Personally, I live in the United States. I, I idealize the United States probably a little bit too much, but this is where I live and I love my country. And so I like to support domestic products. And uh, so when it comes to being in the US, you're not finding a lot of people who are graduating high school and saying, I wanna become a shoemaker. I, I worry for a time where these things just won't be very readily available. So to answer the question that I posed in the beginning of this video, are the nail shank boots still worth it after three years? I would say absolutely yes, for the right person. For some people, no, it's a waste of money. Don't even bother, um, move on, right? But owning these is like owning a motorcycle from Indian Larry or something like that, uh, a hot rod from, from Chip Foos. You know, you know what you're getting into. You know it's gonna be a premium. You know there's not many of them around and they won't be around forever. For some people, these will be it. This is the boot for them. I think for a lot of other people, it's too expensive, not their taste, whatever it is, this isn't the boot for them. But if you are somebody who's watching this or you've seen these or you've had that same just gut reaction when you see a picture of these boots, you know whether you're one of those people or not. Anyway, luckily there's not too many of us because there's only one guy making them and he's not gonna make them forever. So uh, yeah, I think they are worth it for some of us. Anyway guys, that's all I got for you today. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you later.